chest only what God says about me is true only what God says about me is true I align my identity with his words I my identity with his words I bear the image of God I bear the image of God I was created very good by him I was created very good by him in his likeness in his likeness I am God's child. I am God's child. He is the best father. He is the best father. He loves me. He loves me. He adopted me. He adopted me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He protects me. He protects me. I am a holy one. I am a holy one. God made me pure and righteous. God made me pure and righteous. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Holy Spirit lives in me. I can do greater things. I can do greater things. I am a friend of Jesus. I am a friend of Jesus. I'm more than a servant. I'm more than a servant. Jesus speaks to me. Jesus speaks to me. And Jesus never leaves me. Jesus never leaves me. I am an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. I am born of God. I'm born of God. I have victory in Jesus. I have victory in Jesus. Jesus wins so I can win. Jesus wins so I can win. I am an ambassador. I represent Christ in this world. I represent Christ in this world. I can know what the Father is doing. I can know what the Father is doing. I'm a partner with God. I'm a partner with God. God wants to use me. God wants to use me. God wants to change things through me. God wants to change things through me. He will back up my words with his power. He will back up my words with his power. God's love for me is full. God's love for me is full. He has given me hope. He's given me hope. He's given me an inheritance. He's given me an inheritance. My Lord sits at the right hand of God. My Lord sits at the right hand of God. I am seated with him. I am seated with him. I have the power of heaven. I have the power of heaven. As I live on earth. As I live on earth. Nothing separates me from his love. Nothing separates me from his love. Satan is crushed under my feet. Satan is crushed under my feet. Shame has no place in me. Shame has no place in me. I am my beloved's and he is mine. I am my beloved's and he is mine. Let every word be true. Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you for who you have created us and made us through Jesus Christ. You are good. You speak. I pray that our ears are open now to listen to your word and what you would have in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. Final reminder, prayer starts next week at 9.20. The doors, uh, our prayer begins at 9.20 here in the worship center. The doors close at 9.25. There's about a five-minute buffer between when it starts and when, you, uh, when we close the doors. To keep an atmosphere of reverence, the doors to the worship center will not open till 9.50. Kids check-in is going to be downstairs from this point and will not open till 9.50. There will be signage in the back and throughout the church that you can follow um, to get there. But you'll want to go under the, uh, the long walkway under the awning. There will be a sign out there that will point you. And then everything else as normal begins at 10 a.m. That starts next week. We're in our second week of the series. Uh, we're in our second week of the series, Authority, Walk Like Jesus Walked. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4 this morning. And uh, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to buckle in uh, because usually on Sunday mornings I come in and I, um, I say, I have my PowerPoint, it's ready to go. And I say, okay, what can I take away from this so I'm not up there for too long? And then this morning I just kept adding stuff. So we're going to go. I want to start. I want to start with uh, an analogy about authority. What's good, righteous authority, and then what's uh, authority that's trying to take authority where they don't have it. Um, and I'm going to tell you something that I do that my wife doesn't like. Uh, she's not here yet, so I can still do this. And uh, my daughter told some kids in the youth group that I do this, and they were like, "What? Pastor Charles is that?" Okay, uh, I signed up for a Costco membership. 
Right? I like Costco. I was at Sam's Club before. Costco is better in my opinion. Um, so when you go to Costco, you go, you shop, and you sign an agreement that gives you a membership at Costco. It's like 40 bucks a year, whatever, depending on the, the level that you get to. But it's like 40 bucks a year, and you sign an agreement when you, when you uh, sign up and you pay your money. They take your picture, you carry the little card. Right? Part of that agreement is that they have the authority to stop you on your way out and have you show them your receipt. Right? So when you've bought all your stuff and you've gone in to buy two things and you've spent $200 at Costco, <laughs> you get in the line with your receipt and they stop you and they, they count it and they see, okay, there's this many items and they count your cart and they mark it off and they say, you're good to go, you can leave. That's part of the agreement. I've given them authority to do that as I leave. I have not given Walmart the same authority, right? <laughs> have you been to Walmart lately? You go to Walmart, and there's somebody sitting there, and they say, may I see your receipt? You see, the reason they're doing that is because theft is up. And the reason that theft is up is because it's all self-checkout now right? Pay checkers and don't pay this people to check out and don't pay this guy sitting at the door to ask for your receipt. And I looked it up. They can't actually ask for it. And they cannot stop you unless they're detaining you on suspicion of theft and they'll call the police. So what Lauren doesn't like and people were surprised to find is that as when I walk out and the person asks me, may I say, see your receipt? I say, no, thanks. And I keep walking. And the first couple of times I did that, my kids were like, oh. And now they're just like, okay, we're going to go. So you can do that. And if they think I'm shoplifting, they can detain me and call the police. And I'll rebuke them and we'll do all of that later. But I'm, I, I've, look, I've given Costco the authority to do it because I want to shop there. Right? I haven't given Walmart the authority because I kind of need to shop there for some things. But they don't have that authority. Right? And this is what we're going to talk about with authority that's valid and the authority that is invalid during the story of authority. So now if there's a rash of people saying, no, thank you, just don't be wearing your face shirts or anything like that. Just <laughs> go by and do it. We don't need to get that reputation. Um, let's recap authority. Uh, written by Tony Evans and myself. Authority is the God-given right and responsibility delegated to believers to act on behalf on God's behalf, in spiritually ruling over his creation under the lordship of Jesus. Charles Kraft, authority is a personal right given by status or delegation to assert power, whether in the human world or the spiritual realm. And then I came up with a short one. Authority is the believer's legal right to use the power of God to bring his kingdom on earth. We pray, as your, uh, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth, here where we live, as it is being done in heaven. And we'll talk about all of this. And so as we jump in, I'm going to assume something. And if this is a wrong assumption for you, my apologies, but I'm going to assume that you know the story of the fall in Genesis uh, chapter 3. Okay, so I'm going to skim over that, but it's really important to what we're doing. So if you need a refresher, read Genesis chapter 3 while I'm going through Matthew, and uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll go just, at just these next few slides as I read through Matthew chapter 4. Just read it real quick. The first 16, 17 verses, you'll be good to go. Okay, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to, them, and he said to him, 
All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And the devil left him and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. This is the word of the Lord. We're gonna go from the beginning all the way to Jesus' death and resurrection and through the lens of these temptations. What the temptations were, what they mean, how Jesus overcame them, and how these temptations actually tell us the story of authority throughout the Bible. Okay? So the temptations come when Jesus is led by the Spirit in order to face this, in order to stare down Satan, like in an old Wild West movie where they meet in the middle of the OK Corral and no one's around and it's just them. And Satan comes, remember, Satan is not all powerful, Satan is not all knowing, Satan is not, uh, he doesn't have all the information ahead of time. That's not who Satan is. And so when Satan sees Jesus come on to the, to the, to the scene, right, he knows him from the spiritual realm, but now he's here physically on earth. He doesn't have full knowledge of what Jesus' mission is. He doesn't know. So he, I think, in a way, he's, he's using those temptations to try to figure it out. But what he does know is, okay, there's a reason Jesus is here. I don't know what the plan is, but there's a plan. And he wants to hijack the plan, whatever the plan is. Right? So he doesn't know that this whole ark that Jesus has brought into the world from his virgin birth all the way to all of his life, death, resurrection, ascension, all of it, right? it's the plan of redemption. But Satan doesn't know what that is. And so he's trying the same old tricks. He's searching for information, and he's doing everything he can to stop Jesus. So he meets him out in the desert. And so when we go through this, I want you to think of, of this, the back and forth between Satan and God from the beginning, from Genesis all the way up even to Revelation. I want you to think of it like a chess match, okay? If you have a chess board, my, son, my mom taught my son how to play chess. And I went to pick him up uh, yesterday or a couple days ago, I forget when, and he said, I finally beat grandma at chess because she doesn't let him win, which is good. Don't let him win. He's got to learn the game. But in chess, pawns can only move forward. The first time it's two, the second time it's one, but they can move diagonal if they're going to kill somebody. Rooks have to move straight lines this way and they can't hop over anything. Bishops diagonally Knights, they were like, let's just let the knights do whatever they want. So they move two spaces and one over, right? These are the rules of chess. So if, if we're looking at uh, all of this authority as a chessboard, God is sovereign. God is all powerful. So he set up the rules to the game. He tells the chess pieces what they can do within the realm of the chessboard. But somebody's moving the pieces, this is how things have been set up. But God is sovereign, so at any time if God wants to go outside of his rules, he can, right? And if somebody else wants to go outside of the rules, they can't. So we're gonna start, think about this as we talk about, okay, who was authority first given to? Who was authority first given to? We find in Genesis chapter one that Adam was given dominion, authority over the earth. He said, we're going, to make him God, uh, we're going to make man in our image. We're going to give him dominion over everything that we've created. And then the, the mandate for them will be to take this, what we have here in Eden, and make the whole world like it. Adam was given dominion. Partnering with God, Adam had the authority and legal right to rule over the earth. When I mean legal right, he could go and do what God said, operate within this. If Adam's the rook, God told him, you can go forwards, you can go sideways, you can't jump. Now go do what you're supposed to do within the parameters that I've set up. So he's partnering with God in that way, and now he was given legal right to rule the earth. And then one day, 
Eve's walking in the garden alone, and the serpent comes and says, can you eat everything? No, I can't eat everything. Well, why don't you eat it? See what happens. She eats it. Her eyes, she gives it to her husband. Adam eats it. Their eyes are open. We're naked, loincloth, hiding, God coming. Where are you? All of it's happening. So when Satan then deceives the earth's ruler, Adam, death enters the world. And the thing you have to know about death is that death is the, was the enemy's greatest weapon against humanity. Death is the greatest weapon that Satan had against humanity. That's why Jesus came to give us what? Life. If you believe in me, you have eternal life, right? Jesus brings that thing against Satan. And so the world that Adam was supposed to rule over now rules over him. Everything changes. He says, says all of creation, God basically tells Adam, all of creation has changed now. You're gonna work, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be rough. There's gonna be thorns and thistles. Everything's going to be fighting against you. He tells Eve, he says, you're gonna want to follow your husband, but it's not gonna be easy anymore. He says, everything changes in this moment. And so when Adam sins, all of creation falls and all authority is stripped from him to rule the earth. God, God tells, uh, God tells um, uh, uh, the Trinity as they're ruling, he says, he can't stay here anymore. If he eats of the tree of life and he's in this condition, it's not gonna be good for him. And so he's banished from Eden. And Paul makes it clear that Adam is the representative of humanity. So when all authority is stripped from him, it's stripped from all of humanity. Right, God tries, God tries different ways to bring it back, right? After the flood, he gives Noah the same commandment. He, the command he gives Adam. And again, it doesn't work. So who has authority? Who has authority now? If Jesus has set up the rules but isn't gonna move the pieces uh, unless he decides that he wants to in specific situations, then who's given authority? From that moment, from Genesis chapter three, Satan continues to build his counterfeit kingdom. He leads the rebellion in Genesis six. The sons of God that are placed over the nations come under his influence to rebel. If you don't know what I'm talking about right there, please talk to me. Uh, I, I can give you books. I've taught on it several times, mostly on Sunday nights. But this is what happens is Satan begins to build his kingdom. So my my, uh, uh, what I believe and what I'm teaching this morning is that Satan comes and rules and has authority in the earth after Genesis chapter three. We see this in the Bible because by the time that Jesus appears, it is, it is clear that Satan has a kingdom. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus casts out some demons and the Pharisees say, well, how can he do that? He has to be casting them out by the power of Beelzebub. And then it says, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, which is awesome, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, says to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and no city or household can stand if it is divided against itself. So if, I ca so if Satan casts out Satan, then his kingdom is divided and will not stand. So he's giving us a truth there, but he's also saying Satan has a kingdom and it's at work and it's powerful. But later, just a few verses down, he says, but, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's, that's the power, right? That yes, Satan has a kingdom, but Jesus just walks onto the scene and starts ripping it apart brick by brick and piece by piece and demon by demon. In, uh, in John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, the time has come, I will talk to you very little. He says, for the ruler of this world is coming. Right? Jesus himself calls Satan the ruler of 
this world. He says, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has no claim in me. For I am doing what my father has commanded me to do. Let's get up and go. See, Satan's coming for Jesus, and he thinks, Satan thinks that he's setting in, pl- in motion this grand plan to kill Jesus at the cross. Right? But we'll get to that in a second. Paul says that he is the God of this world and that he blinds the eyes of unbelievers. So Satan was given authority in this world when he overcame Adam in the garden. So all of this brings us to the first temptation. Satan is trying to derail whatever Jesus is doing here on earth. So he goes to his tried and true method. In the garden, he goes up to Eve. And he says, can you eat of the tree? And she says, no, we're not supposed to eat of it. And he says, but look at it, just eat it. And it says that she looked at it and saw that it was good to eat. I don't know what that means, but here's what I think it means. She saw this piece of fruit and the sun shining on it. Little dew drops are coming off of it like in a fruit commercial. And it looks beautiful. And she takes it down and she eats it. And Adam, she says, Adam, it's so good. Eat it. And Adam saw that his wife ate it, so he eats it. So this time Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and the scripture lets us know he's hungry. Yeah, thanks. Anybody would be after 40 days. And so what does Satan do? He tempts with food. Why don't you take these stones and make them bread. I know you're hungry. I know you haven't eaten for 40 days. You're out here in the wilderness. Look around, there's no other food. So you fasted for 40 days. Where are you gonna get the rest of your food? Even now, make these stones. Turn them in to bread. He comes at Jesus' most vulnerable point. See, Adam had the word of God. He had the very words of God spoken to him. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of a garden, for in the day that you do, surely you will die. And so when the temptation comes, Adam forgets God's words. And when Jesus' temptation comes, he doesn't forget. He says, and it is written... What is the bread but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? Unlike Adam, who did not abide by the words of God, Jesus says that the real bread is the very words of God. So he turns this all around on Satan and says, nope, Adam failed. He forgot the words, me, I don't forget the words. I remember it all. Me and the Father are one. This is the first temptation. So Satan's like, ah, that doesn't work. Let's try another thing. See, when Adam failed his temptation in the garden, it brings death. Like I said earlier, death is Satan's weapon. So he takes him up to this high mountain, it says. I happen to think it's Mount Hermon. A whole lot of spiritual stuff happens on Mount Hermon, right? So he takes him up there, I think. And it says he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And I think he shows him Rome. But I also think he shows him the Ottomans that are gonna come, the Byzantine Empire that's gonna come, the dynasties of China. I think he shows him uh, America. I think he shows him everything that's to come as well. And he doesn't know what Jesus' plan is, but he wants to derail it. So I... If Satan can kill Jesus, then the plan fails, or so he thinks at this point. So he takes him, uh, I'm sorry, uh, he doesn't go to the high mountain on this one. He goes to the temple. Save all that stuff for the high mountain for the third temptation. He goes to the top of the temple, this one, and he says, throw yourself down. That was good stuff, and I'm sorry it was out of order. He says, throw yourself down. Then he quotes the psalm. That is the spiritual warfare psalm of all 150 of them. He quotes Psalm 91 and he says, for he will send angels to bear you up. You'll be safe. Angels will come. You'll be okay. Here's the question. Does Satan really think that he can kill Jesus? 
I, I think he does. I think he's just warped enough that he does. And here's a theory. It's just a theory. Don't take it to the bank. I've read, I read a lot, I've read a lot of commentaries on the temptations. I've read a lot of stuff, and I've only seen this one place, but it makes sense to me. Okay? In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel prays to God for help. And what happens? An angel is sent immediately to go answer Daniel's prayer. But it takes him 21 days to get there. Why? Because as he's going through the spiritual realm, it says the prince of Persia withstood him. And all the kings of Persia came up against him. So it stopped him. He, the, the prince of Persia is a spiritual entity. Um, it's a principality. It stops him. Right? And he, he can't get by these, these entities stopping him. What has to happen? Michael the archangel has to come in, wreck shop, so this angel can make it to Daniel. This is Daniel chapter 10. You can read it. And he gets there and he says, from the first word of your prayer, I was sent to answer you, but I got held up. So we know from this, follow me, keep with my train of thought, even though it might go off the rails here, just follow me. Satan's demonic forces can hold up angels of God. So what if he is thinking, if I can just hold up these angels that would catch Jesus for three seconds, he'll die. Right? What if, what if when Jesus stops, I send my forces and they, these angels that are supposed to come and bear him up so that his feet will not dash against the rock, what if I can just hold him up for three seconds? Then Jesus dies. That's just my theory. But what we do know is that he's offering to him the opportunity to say, this is who I am. I'm the son of God. I cannot die yet. It's not part of the plan yet. So my theory on the second temptation, the third temptation. And the third temptation, this is more, this is the linchpin of, of, my, of, my, of my belief that Satan has authority over the earth. It's, it's that he has this stolen authority because he takes him to the high mountain, Mount Hermon. We already went over this. I hope you've remembered so far. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the, ki the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and you will worship me. This is what he tells him. See, Satan doesn't, Satan doesn't come offering something that he cannot give. Jesus does not deny that they are Satan's to give. It would be so much easier for Jesus if, if what he quotes back to him is just, no, the nations are my inheritance. Psalm chapter two, ask of me and I will give the nations to you. They're my inheritance, but he doesn't do that, right? Because they are Satan's to give. Well, how does that happen? How does Satan have the right? And again, I've taught on this before. So I'm not going to go through it deeply here. But Yahweh had already delegated the rule of these nations to spiritual beings after, after the Tower of Babel. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob and his allotted heritage. So as the nation spread out after Babel, God takes some of his council members, some of his uh, ruling spiritual authorities, and he puts them over the charge of the nations, and he says, keep them, rule justly over them, show them that I am Yahweh, keep them else. But what do they do? They take worship for themselves. This is Psalm 82. And he says, you have been judged and you will die like men. So Satan at some point, comes in and these nations are held under his captivity. And he did it legally. He didn't overstep his bounds. He just came in and he had them rebel with him. He is the divine rebel. He is the, the picture of rebellion in the spiritual realm. And so when Satan takes him up to Mount Hermon and shows him all the kingdoms of the world, he says, all of these I'm going to give to you right now. But Jesus knows they're his inheritance. They're for him to have. But Jesus now has a choice. He can skip the cross, the pain, the torture, becoming our sin. He can skip all of it and end it right now if he just bows down and worships Satan. But he says, nope, get out of 
hear Satan. You shall not, you shall worship the Lord your God only, and him only you will serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Again, my belief, I think they brought some food with them. I do. They, they, Elijah was fed by ravens. Why can't angels bring a burger to Jesus afterwards? Right. So what's the plan? What was Jesus' plan? What's this plan of redemption? Because man gave away authority, a man must win it back. It's part of the rules. Because man gave away authority, a man must win it back. But we see through the Old Testament that nobody was capable of doing that. Hey, Noah, you go out. You win this back. You take dominion over the earth. What's the first thing Noah does? He lets the earth take dominion over him when he drinks some wine and gets drunk. Israel, you're going to be my people. All of these other nations, I'm forsaking for now, leaving them under the care uh, of uh, of my other servants, and you are my people. Just serve me. Just be the place for my presence. Just do that, and we can take this place over. What does Israel do? Right down the drain. But man, and man cannot win authority over death. Only God can win authority back by breaking death's grip. And so Jesus must come as fully God and fully man in order to win back what was lost. If he just came down as, as the, the, the pers- a person of the Trinity, fully divine, that does no good for mankind. Yes, he will defeat Satan. Yes, he'll have the spiritual realm, but mankind has no place in it, has no part in it. If he comes just fully as man, he's not going to be able to bear the weight of our sin on the cross. And so how does Jesus reverse this? Through death, which in the grand scheme of things is so totally backwards. I'm going to give people life by dying myself? How in any other uh, economy does that work except for God's economy? How does that, how does that work anywhere else? I'm going to win the battle. How are we going to do it? I'm going to die. That's not how battles are won. Imagine if the United States went into World War II. We're like, how are you going to win this battle? We're just going to let everybody kill us. It'll be good. It's not how battles work. And so Jesus does this by taking Satan's greatest weapon, which is death, and using it against him. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood us, Flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. He became flesh and blood also, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Without Jesus, we're in slavery. We're bound and gripped by fear. We're bound and gripped by death. Without Jesus coming, becoming like us and defeating Satan, we're hopeless. And Jesus climbs up on a cross. So Satan thinks he's setting in motion. As things progress, he thinks he's setting in motion his victory to kill Jesus. Right? First he tries to do it with Peter. I have, Jesus says, I have to go. I have to be delivered up to the authorities. I'll kill, but I'll rise again. What does Peter say? Nope. That's not how it goes, Jesus. Well, how does Jesus answer? Get behind me, Satan. He tries to use Peter to convince Jesus to do it another way. And all this stuff is stirred up with the Pharisees. What does he call the Pharisees? The sons of Satan. He's using the Pharisees to try to derail Jesus. And then for Judas, what does it say? And Satan entered Judas. And that leads to the betrayal, the handing over. So Satan thinks he's won. He thinks he's succeeded in killing Jesus. But he didn't realize the reality that he did not kill Jesus. But Jesus died willingly. He's the sacrifice 
for not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. For this reason, my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again, and no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Listen to what he says. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. He says, I do it. I- I'm listening to the Father, and here I run the show. So I have the authority to lay down my life, and I have the authority to take it up again. This is what me and the Father have planned out. This is what we've been talking about. This was the plan of redemption set before the foundations of the world is that I would do it this way and I'm being obedient to my father. And Satan didn't realize it. Satan didn't realize that death was going to be the thing that pulled out that reverse Uno card on him and said, nope, it's, you can't stop it. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which was decreed before the ages for our glory. Rulers of this age are demonic, satanic realms. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So they celebrated when Jesus died, but then all of a sudden, when he's preaching down to the spirits in the underworld, we went over that a few weeks ago, when he's down there, they're like, "Uh uh-oh, what's happening? And when he ascends up and he busts out from the tomb and all of heaven rejoices, they think, we shouldn't have done that. Should have just not even stepped in. Because if they had any idea, they never would have crucified him. This is the plan of redemption. Over the past couple years, I have now said, I will never call it the plan of salvation. We receive salvation in the plan. It's my number one bullet point coming up, so don't, don't judge me too harshly yet. All right? Because by his death on the cross, Jesus takes our sin. He bears the weight of our sin on the cross. He is set forward as a propitiation, John says. He bears our weight. And so when he is dying, what does he say? It's finished. I've took the sin. I've took it all for any who would believe in me. It's done. It's taken care of. I've, I've finished that part of the plan. Right? That's, that's a good step in the plan of salvation. But by his resurrection, he conquers death and he conquers Satan. And so I, I, don't, I don't call it just the plan of salvation because it is so much bigger than just our personal salvation. That is an extremely, extremely important uh, benefit for us that we are saved, declared righteous by the blood of the lamb, but he crushes the serpent's head and he begins to redeem everything, not just us. He begins to redeem all all of creation, this plan before the foundation of the world. So I call it the plan of redemption because he is redeeming everything. Romans chapter eight says that the earth is groaning and waiting that we would be revealed as the sons of God. So creation itself is longing, is hoping that at at the right time when Jesus declares us as part of his kingdom forever at the end of the age, that creation will let out this groan, this sigh of relief, and everything will be changed in an instant. That's what the cross does. That's what the resurrection does. And then in defeating death and ascending to the Father, Jesus now has all authority. All of it. Satan has power, but he does not have the legal right to use him. He has been stripped of it. And it's combined, these two things, this plan, this thing that saves us from our sin, but also defeats Satan, is combined in Colossians chapter 2, 13 through 15. And you, we were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together in him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us With what? It's legal demands. This he set aside, 
nailing it to the cross. And he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus. He takes your sin. He crushes Satan. He transfers you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the glorious son. He does it all. Daniel has a vision of this happening. In Daniel chapter seven, he says, and, and I saw in the night visions, there was one seated on a throne and he was like the, he was the ancient of days. And then he sees something else happening. I saw in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven. How does Jesus ascend to the father in Acts chapter one? Clouds. He's the cloud rider of heaven. He comes with the clouds of heaven and, came one, and there came one like the son of man. Jesus' favorite title for himself. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented for him, to, before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus goes up to the Father, and the Father says, it's all yours for all time. Everybody's gonna worship you. At your name, every knee is gonna bow whether in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, and they will confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's all yours, Jesus, and nobody will destroy it. Nobody can take it away from you. And Jesus lets his people know. He says, and Jesus came to them and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? Daniel's vision said that all people, all tribes, all languages, all nations would come to the knowing of who Jesus is. And so Jesus tells his people, go and make disciple of what? Everything. Everywhere you go, it's yours. Everything your foot walks upon, like he told Joshua, I've given to you. Go, make disciples of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Jesus has all authority now. It was given to Adam, stripped by sin and death. Satan had it for a while. He was a ruler. He had power. Jesus came, comes and takes it all away from him at the cross, the resurrection, at the ascension. Look, what does all this mean? All right, this is the whole story. This isn't one of those messages. It was really hard to do the reflection because I'm just wanting to pass on information that's going to help us in the weeks to come. But what does it all mean? The cross is bigger than we can ever imagine. It's so much bigger. It's not just about salvation, though salvation happens in it. But it's about redeeming all of creation and defeating powers of darkness, reclaiming what Adam lost. Right? That's, that's the gospel. That's the full good news that Jesus preached, that he was gonna come to die, that he was gonna rise again, and his kingdom was being established in who he was. The gospel is so much bigger than, well, you're a sinner and you need forgiveness, which is true for those who are unsaved, but it is so much bigger than that. It is the announcement that Jesus is king and he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And if you follow him, he will forgive you of your sins. He will take you into him and who he is. Because Jesus has authority, Satan can try and stop the kingdom from advancing, but he loses. The gates of hell will not stand up to it where Jesus was when he said that was probably on the shadow of Mount Hermon. And he says, the gates of hell aren't gonna stand up against what, I've, what I am doing. And the way some Christian talks, it just seems like we've lost all hope. Well, things are supposed to get worse before they get better. Right? Well, you know, we don't have to fight the culture wars. We don't have to get out there and do what God's called us to do because he'll come and rescue us at some point. That's not, 
the picture at all that the Bible presents. Right, the picture of the Bible presents a, a empowered, a spirit-empowered church going out into the world and winning back areas, territories, people from the grips of Satan and bringing them into the kingdom of God. That's the picture of the Bible. The gates of hell can't stand up against it. It will keep going and keep going. And there will be battles and there will be fights and it won't be easy. We're still toiling in the fallen world, but Jesus has ensured and secured our victory. And the final point, which I'm just giving you as a taste for next week, right? Just a little appetizer. Come back next week for the entree. If Jesus has authority, then he can give authority to whom he chooses. So how are we going to end this? How are we going to end this? I still have no idea. I have three points. We'll see how it goes. How can God's plan of redemption work itself out for you in your life? If you're not a Christian, the first way that God's plan of redemption works its way out in your life is that you come to him as Lord and Savior and he forgives you of your sin. And that's the first step. Then you can experience freedom from the bondage of Satan. And then you, and you're instantly part of this church that is advancing and going. But for us who are saved, the plan of redemption is still working itself out. Because why? We are ambassadors we are partners with God. We proclaim the, king, the things of Jesus and we go forward with those marching orders. It still works itself out in our life as we become sanctified, as we behold the glory of God, right? As we see him and we are transformed, that is redemption still working itself out in us. As we steward the world and all of his creation, that is redemption continuing to work itself out in your life. So how does it keep going? Right? If Jesus has authority, is there any place that you are struggling and need the authority of Jesus to work power in your life? I mean, think about it. Search yourself. Don't be scared. Don't be frightened. Don't be ashamed. When you start to work that out in your life, and Jesus says, yep, right there. Yep, right there. Yep, right there. That's him calling you back to himself. He's the one who brings freedom to the captives and set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. It's when we, it's when we open ourselves up. God, we're surrendered. We're sur like we sang, we're surrendered to you, God. All of us, we're all surrendered to you. And he says, ah, what about that piece? And some of us will go, nope, no, that's, not, that's all good. Yeah, I don't know what you think you saw, but what you thought you saw is what, not actually what you saw. And I had to do it because this, 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 and this. That, that's what some of us do. And some of us go, and when he says that right there, he goes, oh, do you hate me? Do, do you not love me anymore? He's saying, no, I, I want you to experience more of me. That's why I'm pointing it out. I, I don't condemn you. There, there's no condemnation for you. You're in Christ Jesus. But where are those places? And if the church, under the authority of Jesus, wins in the end, then what is your role? How does who God made you to be as this new creation in Christ, this new creation, how he made you to be, the gifts that he has given you through his Holy Spirit, how do these work itself, work it, how do these things work themselves out in your life so that you join this army going forward? Right. Lauren sent me a, a Facebook message and it was just this picture and it said, uh, the, church, um, the, church is not, uh, the church is not a people to be entertained, but an army to be equipped. And I thought, so you don't think I'm entertaining when I'm up there? Like, right? Shame? No, I didn't do that. <laughs> but this is what it is. This is equipping for, for us to go out, go forward, push back darkness, win things for the kingdom of God. What's your role? 
What's your role? Ben's going to come up as I pray. So if you'd stand with me. You can bow your head. You can keep your head up. Eyes closed, eyes open. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are so much bigger, so much deeper, so much wider than we can even begin to imagine, that we can't even begin to understand the depths of your love for us in Christ Jesus and the power given to us through the Holy Spirit. This morning, we're just going to sing a song of celebration, and that's how we're going to end. If you do want prayer for something, if something that I said struck you, resonated, you can come up front and I will pray for you. You can find me after and I will pray for you. But we're just going to celebrate the victorious risen Savior. So Father, I pray that you would break off any spirit of shame that would keep us from worshiping freely. free to let loose. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's just all sing hallelujah.